Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to Match from My Desk. In today's video, I will be going through everything that you have to memorize for the AP Calc AB exam. So the first thing you have to know is the limit definition of derivatives. This is the limit definition of derivatives. The way it will tend to appear in the exam is basically it's going to give you a limit that looks like this. And you have to recognize that all you have to take is a derivative. I saw it on a past practice. Uh, MCQ so it can definitely pop up so I highly recommend that you memorize this right here and this just, just basically saying what I just told you next you have to know your derivative rules so I find that this table right here is extremely helpful uh, you cannot do calculus without knowing your derivatives super basic so you have to know your constant rule the derivative of a constant is zero the power rule the product rule and in fact for the product rule sometimes it will appear on an frq i saw it in the 2221 calc a b frq the quotient rule the chain rule and you will obviously need all of these in the multiple choice question so i highly recommend that you memorize these if you didn't already then you need to know your basic derivatives. So these are some trick derivatives that you need to know. The derivative of sine, the derivative of cosine, and the derivative of 10. If you have not learned these already, pause this video, take a second to learn them. The same thing for arc sine of x, arc cosine of x, and arc tan of x. In fact, for these, these ones, they will tend to appear in a free response or in the multiple choice where basically it's going to give you the integral of this, for example, and you have to recognize that it's arc sine of x plus c. And these ones you don't need to memorize since you can easily uh, uh, derive them yourself, but it will save you a lot of time to know them anyways. So once again, pause this video and learn these if you have not already. Next, you have some other basic derivatives that you need to know. So the derivative of e to the x, this one is easy, it's just e to the x. If a to the x is that it's a to the x on the natural log of a, the derivative of the natural log of x, which is 1 over x. And this one, a lot of people tend to forget, but you do have to memorize it. Sometimes it will appear on a multiple choice question. Log base a of x is derivative is 1 over x times the natural log of a. You also have to know how to take the derivative of an inverse function. And so if uh, f and g are inverses of each other, then it's derivative g, the derivative of g prime of x is 1 over f prime of g of x. So this is something that you do have to memorize. I personally got it on a multiple choice question myself. So this is something that you have to memorize. So take a second here, memorize this if you didn't already. Next, kinematics with calculus. This one you will often, often see in FRQs, sometimes in MCQs, but I see them more often in FRQs. So you have to know how displacement, velocity, and acceleration relate to each other with calculus. So to go from displacement to velocity, you have to take the derivative. And to go from velocity to acceleration, you also have to take the derivative. And now to go, uh, basically, if you want to do the opposite, from acceleration to velocity, you integrate. And same thing from velocity to displacement. So this is something you absolutely have to memorize. Sometimes in an FRQ, it will give you the acceleration, and you have to find the velocity or the displacement, and you have to find the velocity. So this is something that definitely does appear. So you do have to learn how uh, these three variables relate to each other, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And it is really easy if you just remember this uh, chart right here from displacement to velocity derivative, velocity to acceleration derivative. And then if you go the opposite way, you just integrate. Uh, you also need to know L'Hopital's rule, that's LA chart, and when to use it. So this right here is the statement of L'Hopital's rule. If the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x gives you an indeterminate form, then that limit is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f prime of x over g of x. And also something that you need to know for FRQs when LHR L'Hopital's rule does appear, you have to show that the limit of the numerator and the denominator approach, like for example, zero independently. You cannot just write equals zero over zero. You will not get credit. For example, you need to write the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals zero separately then the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals zero you need to write these separately and then you say uh, th therefore lhr l'hopital's rule tells us that this is true so you need to do them separately next critical points are when f prime of x equals zero or f prime of x is undefined this is something you have to know too these critical points are candidates for local extrema so either minimum or maximum the first derivative test it is to determine if a critical point is a maximum or minimum 
or neither. So this is what the first derivative test tells you. If f prime changes signs from positive to negative at some value x equals c, then f has a local maximum. And it makes sense since the slope is going to go from positive to negative like this. So it's a local maximum at x equals c. Then if f prime changes from negative to positive, so for example, from negative right here to positive, then it is a local minimum at x equals c. And then f prime doesn't change signs at all, so it just keeps going positively or negatively, then f has no local extrema at x equals c. Then the second derivative test is used to determine if a critical point is a max or a min or neither. So if, f prime, if the second derivative of c uh, f, prime, f prime prime of c is greater than zero, then there's a local minimum at x equals c. If f by prime of c is less than zero, then f has a local maximum at x equals c. And if f prime prime of c equals zero, the test is inconclusive, and then you have to use the first derivative test. Instead, you have to know these two derivative tests that will pop up a lot in FRQs. And then concavity, this one is really simple. If f prime prime of x is greater than zero, f is concave up. And I like to rec uh, remember that with this u right here. And if f prime prime of x is less than zero, then f is concave down. And I remember it with this n right here. And so this right here is concave up. It opens up like as if it's smiling. And concave down is like this. Then the point of inflection. If f, f, f prime prime of c and f prime prime changes signs around x equals if f prime prime of c equals zero and uh, the second derivative of f changes signs around x equals c, then the point c f of c is an inflection point. So this is what an inflection point is. It's basically when the graph changes concavity. So for example, here you're going from concave up to concave down. So how do you know if there's an inflection point? Well, f prime prime of c has to be equal to zero and f prime prime has to change signs around x equals c. You also need to know the theorems. So the first theorem you have to know is, the, and by the way, these theorems will usually pop up in FRQs where you have to, to use them. So the first is the intermediate value theorem. So it tells you that if f is continuous on an interval, closed interval from a to b, and n is any number between f of a and f of b, then there exists at least one number c that belongs to the uh, open interval from a to b such that f of c equals n. And this makes sense. So say you have a graph right here. And you have values f of a, f of b, and you have the graph like this. So here you have b, here you have a. And say you have a number n right here. For this number n, there must be an x value c such that f of c is equal to n. This is basically what this intermediate value theorem is telling you. And also you have to know that continuity depends on the closed interval and uh, the theorem will be true for uh, if c belongs to the open interval from a to b next is the mean value theorem and this one does pop up a lot in frqs so basically if it, it tells you if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and differentiable on the open interval from a to b and by the way a quick trick to remember if f is differentiable then it must be continuous so differentiability implies continuity well if these two things are true then there exists at least one c that belongs to the open interval from a to b, such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So basically what this tells you is if you have the interval from a to b like this, there must be at least one value in, actually let me make it curved since it's better, if you have an open interval from a to b, there must be at least one value c that belongs to this interval whose slope is the same as the slope of the secant line from A to B. This is what this mean value theorem tells you. Next, you have the first fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC part one. And what this fundamental tells you is that the derivative right here with respect to x of an integral from A uh, to G of x of f of t dt is just going to be f of G of x. So instead of t, you're going to put the upper bound right here times g prime of x, times the derivative of the upper bound. So the FTC part one does appear in FRQs and it is something that you have to memorize. And something that a lot of people will forget is after they place the bound instead of t, they'll forget to multiply by its derivative. So that is something that you have to remember to do. Next, we have the second fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC part two. And this one is basically um, how to evaluate a definite integral. So the integral from A to B of f of x dx is equal to uh, capital F of B minus capital F of A, where F is the antiderivative, the integral of F. So this one is a really easy thing to know. 
Then you have some key integrals that you need to know. So the integral of a dx, where a is a constant, is ax plus c. This is something you can easily do with the power rule of integrals. Talking about power rule of integrals, you have to know the power rule of integrals. The integral of x to the n dc is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. Then you have to know the integral of sine. You can get that uh, and uh, you can get that from just knowing its derivative. Same thing for the integral of cosine. The integral of secant squared of x. This one actually does uh, could appear on a multiple choice question. So you just have to remember that the derivative of 10 is secant squared of x. And uh, from that, you can know its integral. You also should know the integral of, cos of cosecant squared of x and these integrals right here. Especially uh, the integral of 1 over x dx, some people will get confused and they will write the natural log of x instead of the natural log of the absolute value of x. So you have to remember that it's the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And then you also need to know these derivatives uh, below there. Now, a general solution to a differential equation. Uh, this is a cheat code to memorize. So you have to, uh, basically, uh, this will be helpful in multiple choice questions. However, you have to prove this if it appears on an FRQ. So if it appears on an FRQ, you just solve it. If it's on a multiple choice question, you just uh, memorize that if you have the derivative of y with respect to x equals some constant k times y, then the general solution y is equal to c, some constant, times e to the power of k x. So this is helpful to know on a multiple choice question. However, in an FRQ, you have a sort of, you have to derive y. Now, the average value of a function on an interval formula, this one does appear a lot on multiple choice questions and on FRQs. You have to remember that the average value of a function is the integral from a to b of that function f of x with respect to x divided by b, the upper bound, minus a, the lower bound. So this is something that you should absolutely know. And finally, the volume of solids. So you should know these three met methods to take the volume of solids, and you should know their formula. I suppose you could derive their formula. However, it will take an awful long time, and you just want to know them. So for the disk method, you're going to have pi times the integral from a to b of the radius as a function of x squared. For the washer method, uh, the formula is pi times the integral from a to b of, uh, r of, of uh, the first radius here minus r, r of x squared. So both squared with respect to x. So this is the washer method. And the shell method is just 2 pi times the integral from a to b, r of x times h of x, dx. So for these formulas, I highly, highly recommend that if you have not already done a ton of practice with them, you absolutely have to. The only way you can fully get them is if you do practice. I can uh, link uh, Khan Academy practice for it down below. So I highly recommend your practice. So by the way, key reminder... These are key things that you need to memorize, especially the ones that are easy to forget. For example, that the uh, integral of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. By now, you should already have a solid understanding of the AB syllabus. This is just a quick review for those of you who already know the material, not for anyone learning it for the first time. So if you're learning for the first time, sorry to tell you, but this video is not for you. All right. Well, thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe. And a BC video is coming soon. So that's why you should subscribe.